Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 28th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. As usual, can just ask members to put their phones in a mode that won't interfere with proceedings. Uh, the first item on agenda this morning is to take evidence of the Transport Scotland Bill Financial Memorandum. Uh, we have received 11 responses to our calls on the Financial Memorandum. Today we'll explore some of the issues that we received in these 11 responses. Um, uh, and we're joined for this by officials. Uh, Brendan Rooney, who's the Bill Manager, Yvette Shepherd, who's the Environment and Sustainability Manager, Peter Grant, who's the Bus Policy Team Leader, and George Henry, who's the Parking <coughs> Policy Man Manager. And I welcome you all warmly to the committee this morning. Um, members have received a summary of the responses to the calls for views uh, and a note from the clerk, so I just propose that we go straight into questions. Uh, and to kick, to kick questions off, I'd just I'd like to, to note that from our written correspondence that some of the respondents have said the cost of implementing low emission zones has been underestimated and the reality of setting up and implementing these zones will cost much more. Uh, as than outlined in the financial memorandum, and others have said differently. Um, also, respondents have highlighted the cost of hauliers to upgrade their fleets in line with the requirements of the uh, low emission zones, but these costs are not outlined in the financial memorandum. And so I'd just like your response to, to these views, and I'll leave whoever the lead official is to decide who's going to answer them. Convener, it might be easier if I give a quick broad overview of how that was arrived at and perhaps bring a vet in who's more sort of immersed in, in LEZs and uh, low emission zones, sorry, and um, implementation and how uh, any costs align with that. Um, I mean, the, the provisions within the Bill on Low Emission Zones um, are subject to, um, well, the, the implementation further down the line will be subject to quite a number of variables that will be set out by regulation and set out through local authorities themselves who design a scheme, look at the geographical scope of that scheme, the roads it will cover, um, and, and certain elements like that. Um, again, the regulations will, will set the National Vehicle Emissions Standard, which will dictate vehicles that are compliant or not compliant um, with the, uh, the prohibitions um, which the bill allows for. Um, likewise, things like the technology that will be used for detection um, are also to be set out in regulations. So some of the provisions within the bill are, are quite framework in nature, which means there's obviously quite a number of variables um, within those um, to get down to kind of binary cost figures. So the financial memorandum, as uh, uh, accompanying the bill at introduction, aimed to give uh, best estimates around those, taking those kind of caveats um, into account. So there was always a, um, an element of a window of cost and a, um, an element of fluidity, but... I don't know if, if on, the, on the specifics of um, of implementation and, and, and how costs would, would arise might want to expand. Yeah, I mean, the financial memorandum was based on work that was undertaken to support Scottish Government in considering the introduction of LEZs, which, is, as Brendan has alluded to, it's very difficult to make quantifiable predictions because it will be very much based upon the design of the LEZ, which is being carried out by the local authorities at the moment. Um, so there's a, a scale, there's a, a number of variables around the scale of LEZs, the type of vehicles that will be included, the technology that will be used to actually enforce them, what the enforcement requirements will be. And at the moment, that work is being undertaken by the local authorities. So we will have more clarity as we move forward through the process, both from the Transport Bill published published provisions and the regulations and they come forward, but also in terms of the details that the local authorities bring forward in terms of their design. Um, each local authority is looking at the design and the development of the LEZ in relation to their own specific air quality issues. Um, so the designs that will come forward will vary as the air quality issues vary within the different cities and, and towns across Scotland. So as we move forward, we'll have more clarity on that. And we are working very closely with the local authorities that are currently introducing LEZs, both individually and collectively as a group, um, to further refine these costs and get a better understanding of what the likely costs will be. It just, it's when you see two cities like Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and they've obviously got different views, and Edinburgh didn't seem to indicate in any way there was an issue in terms of the overall costs, but in Aberdeen area there was a you know, concern about the overall cost of introducing these zones. Is, is that because, in the way you've described it, that they are both they may well be envisaging different solutions for their own cities in, in that regard, and therefore there's a different cost envelope for each area? Is that what you're trying to tell me? There is. There will be a different cost envelope for each for each area. 
in the terms of the eventual outcome, they're at different stages of the process of design of the LAZ, so they perhaps have different reflections based on the work they've done to date. Um, and Aberdeen, one of their concerns was that the costings included within the financial memorandum didn't specifically identify key things that they felt would be required to take forward, the introduction of LAZs, um, but Edinburgh have taken a different view there, presuming that the scope for consideration of costs will be as wide as, as is required to deliver an LEZ. Certainly in our dialogue with them, um, the local authorities, again collectively and individually, we're not laying out restrictions in terms of the things that we think the local authorities should consider in terms of the costs of LEZ. So some of the things that specifically Aberdeen refer to are not ruled out of the costs. So it could be just reflective of the different stages of discussion in relation to design. In terms of the principle of how these are funded, um, I'm making an assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they'll be funded both by contribution from the Scottish Government, but also from the local <coughs> government themselves as well, in terms of how these finally these LEZs come to be in place. I think the financial memorandum discusses it being a collaborative approach, partnership working with costs being borne by the Scottish Government in relation to some aspects, but also by the local authority in, in terms of the local delivery aspects of the LEZs. OK, thank you. Alexander? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, so a question on methodology of a pavement parking, pavement parking and double parking. Um, you uh, explained that the estimated cost yeah, was a... Um, you know, issues of uh, uh, how you're arriving and the lack of data uh, and that you engage with the City of Edinburgh and Aberdeenshire Council uh, to, to get that data. But then Aberdeenshire Council uh, have replied stating that they, that their, uh, the figures uh, within the memorandum on payment and double parking do not reflect those that were provided by, by them. Um, you know, given that they and South Ayrshire Council and East Ayrshire Council you know, are all questioning the methodology and you know, given the huge difference between uh, enforcement in a, in a city uh, and, and rural Aberdeenshire, where I represent, where you've got you know, multiple small settlements and, and, and you know, very, very different landscape. Uh, I wonder if you comment on that. Yes, no worries. I'll take that. Um, the forecast in the financial memorandum came from um, Aberdeenshire and City of Edinburgh Council. Through our stakeholder engagement, um, we asked all the local authorities that we were, that were at our parking stakeholder groups um, to see if we could work with them to, to help develop um, the cost for the financial memorandum. Aberdeenshire Council and City of Edinburgh Council helped, helped us as we developed those. Um, and we discussed the draft criteria of what would actually be um, of the national ban on parking and double parking and, and whether exemptions would be taken forward and how, how they would be assessed, etc. Um, so the, the two councils that we did engage with know a, a bit more about the criteria than what, what others did. Um, officials from Aberdeenshire Council submitted the figures um, in the financial memorandum. They were regarded as the best estimate at that time. Um, if Aberdeenshire Council now feel that they're not representative of, of those figures um, that were there, then I'm happy to discuss that further with them. We actually have an ex-parking stakeholder working group on Monday, um, and I will raise that with Aberdeenshire, and we'll get some clarity um, on that. Thank you. Okay, so I jumped a bit over here. Sorry, Alexander thought was going to go on um, LEZs, but it's my fault. I should have asked you a bit more explicitly. So we're back to LEZs now, and Patrick. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, just to, to follow up on uh, the convener's point uh, before I come on to my own, uh, uh, Bruce Crawford was asking about the, the balance of uh, the costs being borne by uh, both the Scottish Government and local authorities. Um, obviously, some of the savings uh, as a result of LEZs will come through uh, impacts on health, if it works, uh, and that's uh, more about the, the Scottish Government's budget than local authorities, not exclusively, but more so. Some of the, the potential... Uh, reductions in revenue might come from parking. Again, if it's successful in, in changing the modes that people choose to use to travel, uh, local councils might actually see reduced revenue. Is there not an argument for more of the, the cost being borne by central government budgets than <coughs> by local government budgets, given where the, the savings and, and potential reductions in revenue might come in the future? I think at this stage we haven't identified what proportion of costs would be borne by the local authorities and what proportion of costs would be borne by central government. Certainly the funding that we've put in place this year has been primarily to support the local authority in terms of the resource for delivering 
the, the, the design of LEZs, and we have three out of the four local authorities that have a, a current um, commitment to introducing LEZs have taken up that funding. Um, at this stage, in terms of the delivery of, of the design and the, the implementation work, the costs that are being borne by the local authorities at this stage are in terms of resource, so they are providing, to some extent, the staff resource to do the implementation work. So at the current stage, where we've got a little bit more clarity on and where that split is, that tends to be how it, how it's sitting. Um, going forward, I think we were we need to better understand what the implementation costs are around the actual introduction, the infrastructure, the back office enforcement, the support systems. Again, that will be different for different local authorities. Will depend very much on the scale of the LEZ. So that that future balance will be agreed by by negotiation with councils. We'll continue to work with our local authorities on that. Um, the the modelling that's been done that's developed some uh, cost estimates uh, has been uh, done by Jacobs uh, in a report. Uh, the 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 key findings of which are in the financial memorandum, but the the report itself hasn't been published. Uh, why hasn't that been published? It's, 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 it's technically still classed as, I think, as a work in progress. Um, it was a, a, a piece of work that was prepared to inform consideration of the introduction of LEZs. Um, so it will be published when it's completed? Uh, we can certainly clarify whether that will be the case. That, that would be helpful to know. Um, it seems to rely heavily on the London ultra-low emission zone to, to draw its, its, um, its kind of theoretical conclusions from. Um, that's obviously a very different city than, than we have in Scotland. Uh, even our, our biggest city that, that might consider uh, what's been described as a large low emission zone, uh, you wouldn't be talking about a, a density of traffic as much as, as London was before the introduction of its congestion charge, for example. Um, also, Glasgow might consider Areas like Great Western Road or, or Dumbarton Road are some of the most polluted parts of the city. Areas uh, along the, 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 the motorway or the expressway might be covered in a, a low emission zone. So you might be talking about rather a different shape than just a blob in the middle of the city centre. Um, isn't it a bit of a stretch to say that you just scale down uh, the London model, the, the ultra low emission zone in London, uh, given that a different shape or configuration uh, in Glasgow might result in a very, very different ratio between the, the amount of work that needs done to administer this thing and the number of vehicles uh, or the proportion of vehicles in the in the city that are being captured by it. Yes, and I think that goes goes, goes back to the, the information in the financial memorandum which comes out of the Jacobs work, which was, was what did take heavy, heavy made, did make heavy use of the data coming out of the London Low Emission Zone, but also looked at other work that had been undertaken by Edinburgh um, and Glasgow around the potential in introduction of LEZs in, in a Scottish context from work that they had done previously as part of their air quality management work. And it did also take into account information from other European LEZs, um, but, but it was, was focused around work that had been done in London. That reflects the, the kind of indicative nature of the cost included within the financial memorandum um, <clears throat> as a best estimate based on data that we have and a series of assumptions, reasonable assumptions around the likely outcomes of LEZs. But ultimately, it will, the cost will be dependent upon the LEZ design and there is a, a fair amount of variability. It could, could potentially come out of the different cities' approaches. It, it, they're being encouraged to consider locally specific solutions for the air quality issues that they have which may result in, as you say, very different LEZs in different cities and different costs associated with that. I should just have declared an interest uh, convener. I live on Dumbarton Road in the middle of one of the air quality management areas. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess just, just finally then, what is the general approach when you have a government bill and a, a, a best faith attempt to, to construct some costings, but an acknowledgement that those are not the actual costs which will emerge. What, what is the, the general approach to uh, trying to revise what's agreed, if Parliament agrees the financial memorandum, uh, and, and make sure that we actually get funding in place that will meet whatever costs emerge, which are unlikely to be actually what, what the numbers are in this document? I think that that's mainly founded on the work that we're doing. The approach to LEZ in terms of, of the commitment in the four cities um, that, that we have at the moment 
is based on working with in partnership and collaboratively with those four local authorities. So we are working very closely with all of the individual authorities as part of their delivery groups. Um, and we're also working with them collectively um, through the leadership group, through the consistency group, to try and better understand what these costs will be going forward as the design emerges so that we can track um, increased clarity around costs. Um, and also so that we can identify with the local authorities collectively how to get best efficiencies around, you know, how to get best value for the money that we do invest in, particularly infrastructure. So I think it will, going forward, it will be continuing to work with the local authorities in order to understand the des emerging designs, and that will help give clarity on what the actual costs will be, um, and that, that will be a big part in shaping the funding packages going forward. Okay, thank you. Angela, you've got a supplementary in this area, am I right? Uh, yes. I, I suppose, good morning. I suppose, like other uh, members, I'm uh, looking at a financial memorandum of 46 pages, and uh, at the end of the day, we are resting on our, our best estimates uh, thus far to, 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 to costs. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the feasibility studies uh, that were conducted, um, not just in Scotland, uh, but in England, and whether... Uh, the findings from the feasibility studies, whether that complements the work undertaken by Jacobs and uh, the, the 11 submissions that this committee's had. I appreciate it's not a, a large number of uh, written pieces of, of evidence or whether the feasibility studies, the works done by Jacobs, the written information that the committee has, whether it's pulling things in different directions or whether there, there's actually a, a, a point of convergence. The feasibility studies, particularly in relation to the work in Scotland, were done some time ago, so there's obviously a, not necessarily parity in, in relation to exactly what they were looking at. Um, they were looking at similar models, but not necessarily the same uh, around what we would be introducing. Um, and there is some information in the, the financial memorandum that talks about the variability in costs in terms of um, what was being allowed for the automatic number plate recognition camera systems. You know, that is quite a a, a, quite a range of costs. The, the Jacobs work that, that we looked at came out with a cost around £20,000. Um, the Edinburgh Feasibility Study had the camera costs at around £37,000, so there is quite a, a, a range there. Um, again, the work that we're do, doing with the local authorities at the moment is coming up with, to some extent, a different set of figures around that particular aspect. Um, so they didn't contradict the Jacobs work, um, but there is not necessarily identical alignment with the costs that are coming out, but that's partly reflected on the assumptions that were being made around what the LEZ would be, what the scope of the vehicles would be, what the geographic spread would be, um, and, and it's, it's different assumptions were made in, in relation to all of the different studies that have been undertaken. Okay. And the financial memorandum talks about an optimis optimism bias of 44% and a 10% uh, risk um, a, a assumption of 10% on year one costs. Uh, would that be the norm or is, or is that quite a, a generous calculation? Um, <coughs> that's not something I can directly take up comment on. I think it, that, that aligns with a general approach that we would take in relation to transport projects more generally. Um, so it doesn't seem particularly out of kilter with the approach that we would normally adopt, but we can certainly clarify that and come back to the committee if that would be useful. Okay, and you uh, very helpfully uh, described your uh, ongoing work and dialogue um, with uh, local authorities. Uh, I couldn't find uh, in the papers a formal response from COSLA. Um, has there been a written response from, from COSLA? Um, there's been a written response sorry, from COSLA um, to the lead committee on the bill in its entirety. Um, there's obviously, I think, not in the call to evidence for this, this committee um, being a response directly from from COSLA. And, and to the government's consultation on the bill? Um, well, the, the government didn't consult on the bill in its entirety. Uh, it took forward a series of, okay. of consultations based on it. It's quite a multi-topic, broad scope bill. Um, and they were taking forward. I'm afraid I don't have in front of me whether COSLA directly 
uh, responded in writing. But I do know, as Yvette's alluded to, there's a lot of engagement with local authorities and um, engagement with COSLA ongoing. And, and, and my, my final question, convener, um, not, notwithstanding that you know many of the costs depend on design and implementation, um, and you know some of the actions will be within the gift of the Scottish government, but a lot depends on the actions taken forward uh, by our partners and local government as well. Um, but it is the case that where something is a new burden, um, it would be the norm for that to be factored into uh, matters as they proceed. If there are new burdens on local government, that they will have to be uh, accommodated financially from the Scottish Government within the block grant. Is that right? Uh, that's my understanding of, um, yes, the agreement with COSLA around new burdens that are set via legislation. Um, I mean, obviously, the low emission zones some of the joint commitment stems from the programme for government commitment that um, the Scottish Government have made around the key four cities. Um, so those are the ones being looked at in the uh, short term, um, whether or not other local authorities um, subsequently choose to implement low emissions zones further down the line. That isn't mandated uh, via the bill. OK, thanks. Murdo. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to ask about the um, potential impact of LEZs on small business. And it's an issue that's been raised with me by the uh, Federation of Small Business and others. And I think one of their concerns is, for example, you might have a, 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 a self-employed tradesman who's buzzing in and out of uh, a LEZ area in a diesel van of you know five or six years old that you know doesn't doesn't meet the, the requirements and the impact that's likely to have on the operation of a very small business. And I'm wondering. In the financial memorandum, has there been any specific work done looking at the likely impact on very small businesses like, like that? There hasn't been any specific quantified work done in relation to small businesses. We have been having fairly extensive engagement with Federation of Small Businesses, with trade bodies, with chambers of commerce to try and understand broadly what the issues are for, for their members. Um, and we did obviously have the, the consultation on building Scotland's low emission zone, so we've taken account of responses to that consultation, but there is no quantified costs associated with the, the Im impact on small businesses that, uh, to, pre to present in the financial memorandum. Okay. Um, th there is, in, in the bill and, and in the financial memorandum, proposals around potential grant schemes that might assist. I mean, can, can you say any more about how that's likely to be able to assist a small business that's impacted by this? The, the, the recent, most recent programme for government um, included the, the creation of a low emission zone support fund um, and we are currently looking at how that could support a range of cohorts of those affected by the introduction of LEZs and that includes um, those users of low, like goods vehicles which is the predominant vehicle used by small businesses so that work is underway at the moment to look at how those cohorts could be best supported through the introduction of LEZs, those who would be most um, find it most difficult to comply with the requirements when they come forward. Okay, and and do we know when we'll get a, a clearer picture as to how all that will 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 be finalised? <coughs> We're targeting the, the LEZ support fund um, details for for air, air, April next uh, April twenty nineteen. There is overlap again um, around the issues of how the LEZ's design are designed by local authorities. Obviously, Glasgow have, have come forward with proposals that would see all vehicle types included within their LEZ requirements. That stage hasn't been re reached yet for, for Dundee or Aberdeen or Edinburgh, so we're not certain at the moment which cohorts of vehicles would be most affected by LEZs at, at this stage. There is obviously the potential for different decisions to be taken in different cities, depending on which vehicles are deemed to be the ones that are Im impacting on air quality. So there is there is there is an element of variability in terms of the impact on small businesses related to the design of the LEZs, which we'll be more clear on as we move forward. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, James. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, one of the aspects of this in relation to bus operators is uh, in terms of the costs of retrofitting uh, first bus have stated that the cost of retrofitting a bus would be £25,000, and if they did that through their whole fleet, it would come in at £5.8 million. And uh, one of the issues with that is that if there are additional costs like that, 
uh, they may be passed on to passengers in terms of higher fares and you may see reduction in bus routes. So what, in terms of the financial memorandum, uh, what account has been taken in terms of public, public funding support that would be available to bus companies that were retrofitting? The, the scenarios presented in the financial memorandum from the Jacobs work include an allowance for supporting bus operators to become compliant um, it's a, the, the, the costs presented are a mixture of retrofit and scrappage for older vehicles that may be reaching the end of their, their life. It, it, for other reasons, it, separate to, to the LEZ. Um, so that is taken. That those that that is included within the costs presented in the financial memorandum. Taking that forward in a practical sense in, in relation to the policy, um, rather than the bill, for the local for the LEZs that are already in play. There is um, currently a <coughs> bus emissions abatement retrofit programme underway. Um, the phase two of that programme was launched a few weeks ago and it offers support to bus operators for retrofit and in, indeed phase two includes for scrappage um, in relation to those who are going to have to meet LEZ requirements. You may not have this figure to hand, but roughly what kind of percentage of support is available to a, a bus operator if they're taking part in the retrofitting programme? The, the Bayer Phase 2 scheme um, will offer 40% of funding to large operators, rising to 60% for smaller operators of the total cost of retrofit. So that includes the cost of the kit itself and its installation and also for ancillary costs up to five years. So the other costs that go along with um, the retrofitted vehicle operation, telematics and, and maintenance and those sorts of issues. So uh, they'll be offered 40% of those costs. The actual cost to a bus operator will vary because it will depend upon the contractual arrangements that they make with whichever partner in the industry that they choose to go with for retrofit. I appreciate the, the contribution that you've outlined and uh, I also appreciate there's a balance about these things. Has the, there any account been taken of the fact that because of the increased costs involved to bus operators, uh, they may reduce bus routes and that may lead to a contradiction with the policy objective of the bill um, in terms of lowering emission zones because if people aren't able to go on bus routes, they may, if they've got <coughs> cars, take the cars uh, and you end up with a conflict in terms of the policy objective. Certainly not in the financial memorandum. It, it, it doesn't reflect. It doesn't reflect that. I'm not sure that we would have an understanding of the potential costs associated with that at this stage. And, and we are obviously engaging with the bus industry around LEZs more generally and on the financial implications in particular. Thanks. supplementary, and Tom's got a supplementary, I think, as well. Yeah, just very briefly. I don't think anybody uh, would uh, would have a, a huge problem with the fact that there are some uncertainties uh, around uh, many aspects of this, including the, the costing. But this, the Scottish Government says it is committed to introducing low emission zones into Scotland's four biggest cities over the next couple of years. If one of those local authorities comes back and says, actually, some aspect of this uncertainty means we are not able to go ahead, whether it's on the grounds of cost or anything else, is it the Government's position that the Scottish Government will come back and solve that problem uh, and ensure that the, the low emission zones go ahead. That may be one to put to Ministers, but if that's appropriate, perhaps you could pass that on? Yep. Thank you. I think there's a nod to say she's going to pass it on, yeah. Was it, was it on the LEZs as well, Tom? Yes. OK, on you go. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Um, one of the issues that's clearly very topical at the moment is the challenges faced by the high street, both from online retailers um, and out-of-town shopping centres. If LEZs are successful in their objectives, they will reduce um, congestion and increase air quality, which may make it a more attractive proposition to shop within a town centre or a city centre. Has any work been undertaken as part of this process to assess what impact that may have on economic activity and any net benefit that could be accrued by local authorities as a consequence? No, there's not been any quantified work undertaken in relation to that. We are um, in dialogue, obviously, with um, chambers of commerce across the four cities and, and more specifically at a national level as well. Um, 
to help understand their issues and any concerns that they would have around that. But no, there isn't any quantified work being undertaken to look at that potential economic benefit. Thanks a bit for dealing with all these questions, Emily Zeds. We're going to let you off the hook a bit now and let, uh, go into pavements. So, Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in um, pavement parking and double parking and and uh, and I guess the financial memorandum uh, statements in, in about. Uh, how do you cost it or how to make it accurate? Um, I was reading in our brief that South Ayrshire Council and East Ayrshire Council and South Lara, all in my South Scotland region, um, they're, they're, they're saying that there's a financial burden relating to the enforcement of parking, uh, pavement parking and double parking, and they're c concerned or they believe that making local exemptions could mean the cost could escalate substantially. Um, from what was estimated in the financial memorandum. So I'm wondering if any further detailed costing has been performed to create more accurate or more up-to-date view to determine further costs so that we can um, look at implementing pavement parking or restrictions and enforcement and exemptions. I mean, has there been further costings done? Um, yes, well, obviously the policy is about uh, making our roads and pavements um, accessible for all. Um, the the policy is very much around changing people's behaviours around, around you know parking on footways etc. And it's very difficult um, for us to really cut cost of the assessment um, and particularly implementation when it's covered um, with you know potentially the number of exemptions which maybe local authorities wish to um, promote. Um, we are continuing to work with um, local authorities and COSLA to develop. Um, through our parking standards working group um, to develop more robust costs for each of these respective areas. Um, as I'd said previously, two of the local authority areas that did um, offer up um, to work with us with the costs um, know, know a bit more about the criteria to which we are implementing. Um, and, and that assessment and, and implementation is, is ongoing. Um, is the best estimates that we've provided, you know, when uh, a bill introduction, but we're very much committed to working with local authorities in COSLA to develop more robust costs for each of these areas as we move forward through the parliamentary process. And you said that there's a, a parking standards working group meeting coming up soon. So would that be part of your discussion ongoing to look at financial impact for local authorities? It it, it very much is. The, the meeting which takes place on Monday, um, we, we have asked all local authorities to, um, to join us um, and we have good representation um, at that group. Um, it's very much talking about the, the exact criteria of, of you know, footway widths, carriageway widths, what should um, be available for um, allowing footway parking um, to, to exist um, and what meets an exemption and, and otherwise. Um, and we'll very much talk about the, the costs around that um, as we go through that process. Each local authority needs to map out where their footways and, or pavements are so that they can, um, I guess, feed into that assessment so that there, there would be a variable in some areas. Yeah, I mean, understandably, um, you know, local circumstances will vary. Um, on, it makes the kind of assessments obviously um, uh, difficult um, to, to represent right across on a national basis. So that's why we need the local authorities to to, to join us at this group, um, look at the um, the criteria which is set for them to then go and carry out their assessments and, and, and you know, provide the financial figures, uh, which will give us more robust costs for moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I think you've got questions on this as well. Yeah, thanks. It's just on that, that same uh, issue there. Uh, would you mind trying to clarify, see the estimates that you've provided, uh, £40,000 from Edinburgh and £10,000 from Aberdeen, and there's been disagreement about that, particularly from East Ayrshire, my own authority. Is that the cost of assessing the issue or implementing it? No, that was the cost um, that, w that was for assessing. So, theref so therefore, um, streets where we know that footway parking exists, um, you know, these can come from from various areas because there is there is a number of complaints which come through local authorities at this um, even just now. So they know where the footway parking problems do exist um, and how they would uh, would wish to address that. So the local authorities, um, when we worked with them was in the development of the financial memorandum, was purely around the assessment of that. Um, whether they choose to. 
um, promote exemptions on these streets to allow footway parking to exist and still make sure that there is enough space for pedestrians and uh, wheelchair users and, and you know, families with prams, etc., um, to be able to use the footways in the way that they, they're there for um, kind of remains to be seen. So the, the, they'll have to go through this assessment process. Um, and we did look at flexibility and, and the way that they can carry out assessments. So it may not necessarily need to be full um, site visits for it for everyone. People may be able to to use inventory databases and other technologies to do desktop studies to identify where they can um, where footway parking is a problem first and foremost, and then do site visits after that. But suppose the East Ayrshire says convener it, it ends up much more. I mean, much more could be twenty or thirty locations, for example. What about the implementation cost? Is there any estimate in the memorandum about the actual implementation cost? I mean, the implementation costs, um, we, we've, we've certainly tried to um, minimise that as, as much as possible. Um, you know, there, there's the signs that will be required to allow footway parking to exist already exist um, or already approved in the traffic signs regulations and general directions. Um, those signs could go on existing street furniture, um, so there might not necessarily be a requirement to put in new street furniture, i.e. poles, for those signs to go on. Um, and then it would be white lining, um, so, you know, for to mark out bays on footways, you know, or parts of footways for to allow people to park. So we're, we've tried to um, have an efficient process as much as possible um, and, and as much as a cost effective, um, you know, measures that, that, that they're not too expensive for local authorities to put in. Okay. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you very much. Can I thank the Bill team for giving us their evidence this morning? Um, you were very candid about the challenges you face about it and very knowledgeable, obviously, in terms of the responses we got. Um, the clerks will now uh, draft a letter to send to the lead committee uh, in this regard and now suspend this meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the second item on today's agenda is to consider a Scottish statutory instrument which provides for the 2018 autumn budget revision. And before we come to the motion seeking our approval, then agenda item three, we have to an evidence session on the order. And we're joined for this session by Kate Forbes, MSP, who's the Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy, who's accompanied by Scott Mackay of the Scottish Government. I invite the Minister to make an opening statement and welcome her to her first appearance before the Finance and Constitution Committee. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. It took a promotion to be allowed back onto this committee, so uh, <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, and as the committee will know, the autumn budget revision provides the first of two opportunities to formally amend the Scottish budget for 1819. And in order to assist the committee with their scrutiny, I've provided a brief guide to the autumn budget revision prepared by my officials. And that guide sets out the background to and details of the main changes proposed, which I hope the committee has found useful. As uh, members will know, the First Minister announced uh, a restructuring of the Scottish administration and Table 1.1 of the Autumn Budget Revision supporting document provides a full reconciliation between the former Scottish Government portfolios and the new Scottish Government structure. And this year's ABR deals with four different types of amendments to the budget. Firstly, a couple of funding changes. Secondly, a couple of technical adjustments that have no impact on spending power. Thirdly, a small number of Whitehall transfers. And finally, some budget neutral transfers of resources between portfolio budgets. And the net impact of all of these changes is an increase in the approved budget of £7.3 million to £40,505.9 million. And Table 1.2 and page 5 of the supporting document shows the approved portfolio budgets following the changes sought in the ABR. And the supporting document prepared by the officials provide background on the net changes. And I'd like to just briefly sketch out um, those changes and then um, move the motion. So the first set of changes includes the deployment of funding across multiple for portfolios to cover EU exit activity, additional funds for the Scottish Futures Trust, for the Schools for the Future initiative, and further funding for raising attainment. And in total, these changes increase the budget by £32.1 million. The second set of changes comprise a small number of technical adjustments to the budget with a net impact of £31.2 million on the aggregate position. These adjustments are necessary to reflect to ensure the budget is consistent with the accounting requirements and with the final outturn that will be reported in our annual accounts. The main technical adjustment is the removal uh, from budgets of £31 million in interest and repayments on capital borrowing, and those should be routed directly through the Scottish Consolidated Fund rather than through Scottish Government accounts as per legislation set out in the Scotland Act 1998. That subsection states that amounts required for the repayment of principal and payment of interest and sums borrowed under this section are to be charged on the Scottish Consolidated Fund. With regards to Whitehall transfers and allocations from um, Treasury, there's a net positive impact on the budget of £6.5 million in relation to small transfers, which are all listed in the supporting documents. And the final part of the budget revision concerns the transfer of funds within and between portfolios to better align the budgets with profiled spend. And as in past years, there are a number of internal portfolio transfers which have no effect on portfolio totals, but ensure that internal budgets are monitored and managed effectively and the main transfers between portfolios are noted in the ABR supporting document and the guide. As we move towards the financial year end, we will continue in line with our normal practice to monitor forecast outturn against budget and wherever possible seek to utilise any emerging underspends to ensure we make optimum use of the resources available in 1819 and to proactively manage the flexibility provided under the fiscal framework agreement between Treasury and the Scottish Government. And I shall be providing committee with a mid-year report on revenue and spending to date alongside the spring budget revision when published to improve the transparency of the budget management process and decisions taken in year in line with the budget process review group recommendations. And so... Thank you very much, Minister. That's very helpful. Um, my, my first question doesn't specifically relate to any of the areas you've raised, but it is um, in the budget revision documentation and under Table 18A and the funding reconciliations and, and issues to do with the reserve. And I'm just curious about the government's position in terms of the reserve. Um, specifically, to what extent the purpose of the reserve is to allow the government to draw down additional funds for public expenditure and to what extent it sees it as a need to build up funds to address any potential shortfall that might come from arising from any tax forecast errors that may emerge. And it's that's something, obviously, the committee has been very 
interested in now around the whole issue of the tax forecast errors and therefore just be a, your, an understanding of the government's position that I think would be quite useful to us as part of this exercise. Well, um, that table 1.8a is relatively um, a new addition and I hope that um, committee members found it useful in terms of improving transparency. Of course, Scotland Act 2016 powers allow Scottish Government to build up funds when possible and that serves a number of purposes and the, the convener has set out a number of them. They are, of course, to address uh, unforeseen budget pressures, to manage the obvious volatility in tax receipts and shortfalls in forecast um, related to forecast error and to smooth all types of spending. The Scottish Government has previously made clear that it intends to build up reserve, the balance in the reserve over time as resources allow it to do in order to have a financial cushion available to it and to prudently manage that underspend across financial years. And that's particularly important with greater powers over taxation and the obvious volatility that comes with tax receipts. Of course, the Scottish Government cannot overspend its budget, and so it's a prudent approach to manage the budget over a number of years, uh, which has been um, endorsed by the uh, Auditor General. Okay, so the bottom line of that was that available for future deployment is £197.7 million pounds in that table. Uh, is that some of the money that the, is, is, is at least part of it, or a significant part of it, some of the money that the government's going to put away for a potential rainy day. Is, is, that, is that the intent of that future <coughs> deployment cash? Well, that, indeed. So the, what that um, sum there, um, which is available um, for future deployment, could, can be carried forward. But obviously um, those figures will um, be seen more clearly um, when the Scottish Government publishes its draft budget uh, on the 12th of December. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, I want to ask about one of the internal transfers uh, that features uh, in the uh, instrument before us. There's a transfer from the Health and Sport uh, Department to Education and Skills in respect of nursery and midwifery education of £58 million. Pounds. Now, this is a transfer that's appeared in accounts since, I think, 2008-9 on an annual uh, recurring uh, basis. And given that this is, appears in the accounts every year and every year appears as a transfer, uh, I wonder whether it not make more sense just to have this as permanently part of the education and skills budget rather than the health budget. It's an issue I raised this time last year with the Cabinet Secretary when he was sitting, uh, where you are now, at Minister, and he said at that point I had made a valid point. Uh, but I see that nothing has changed, so perhaps it's time to reconsider um, uh, it is a very valid point, no, a, and I recognise that it's a question that the committee has asked a number of times before, and in my own preparation for this committee appearance, it's one that I asked too, um, and it is obviously a, an annual transfer. I think that a few quick points that I'd say in, in response to it is that um, it is initially allocated, of course, to the ministerial portfolio where the policy decisions are taken and where there is ministerial responsibility over that area and then transfer to the por portfolio where the spending occurs. And where there might be savings or where there might be changes to policy, it would impact the health budget and they would um, see the savings coming to the health budget. They would see the impact of any policy changes on the health budget. And so th the way that it has been done for years and has being done again this year ensures consistency and transparency that where there are policy changes or where there are savings it flows to the health budget but of course it is education's responsibility to um, then deploy it through the Scottish Funding Council. So I take the valid point I think I have been satisfied in asking the same question that the, this way of doing it ensures that there is transparency and consistency because the portfolio minister who is responsible for it would be um, Jean Freeman as Cabinet Secretary for Health. If I could just ask a brief follow-up to that, uh, Convener. Um, given everything you've said about transparency, I wonder whether it would not be more transparent, though, just to present this as part of the education and skills budget. Because what this, in effect, does in presenting it the way you do is it, it shows the health and sport budget has been quite substantially higher to the tune of nearly £60 million than is the actual spend at the year end. And we know this happens 
on an annualised basis? Would it not improve transparency if you were to change the way this is presented? I, I take that point. I think where there is a, an important point is to make sure that we are completely upfront and transparent when particularly it comes to the budget revision and the spring budget revision in where these lines are, um, where responsibility lies and then where spending um, actually happens. And so if there are other ways that we can improve the transparency, then I'd be very happy to consider those um, additional points. I think having taken that point, the way that it's been done for years has happened for years because so long as there is transparency over the budget revision and so long as committee uh, and others can see where these lines are being, um, where responsibility lies, but then where spending lies as well, so long as there's transparency on that point, I think that um, that, that does meet the requirement for transparency. Yeah. Just a slight so, convener, thank you. Good morning. Um, you're talking about transparency and I think actually it's quite transparent to see that the 58 million goes from health and sport to education because doesn't that allow us to focus or or see that the 58 million is spent on nursing and midwifery uh, alone right and I probably need to declare that I'm a nurse but uh, we can then see that it's specifically spent on education for nurses and midwifery rather than maybe this education spend going somewhere else within that education portfolio? Well, I think it comes back to the the point around the, the importance of the budget revision and the importance of um, my officials and myself providing the committee with as much information as possible to be able to track um, those changes. Uh, and, you know, I, I take the point that this is a question that will be raised um, probably every year, and it maybe sounds a bit like... Um, a broken record, but it does mean that the committee has full sight on uh, these uh, these internal transfers, which are at the end of the day budget neutral. Because of assiduous people like Murdo, of course, this is probably the most transparent bit of the whole Scottish government budget now. Because I ask this question every year, but effectively, the Minister, I've got this is right as well. This means that um, in terms of ensuring the outcomes that health need, actually, this provides a mechanism to ensure that they can get the, the amount of money spent on that area that they ex they think is required to deliver the outcome, the number of nurses and midwives who have. That's right, absolutely. And it goes back to the point I made earlier that where there would be changes in this policy, it would have an impact on health. Where there might be savings on this policy, it would have an impact on health. And that is why that, that line is a health line um, and, and is then moved through the year. James, a slightly different point. Yeah. Uh, again, it's to do with transfers, uh, this time from the Social Security and all the people budget to the communities and local government budget. There's three transfers um, coming to 100 and just about 102 million. Uh, I wonder if you can just give a bit more detail on that, Minister. Yeah, so is that, um, that's the 37.9 million, is it? The 12.1 yeah, there's, there's and the 5 million. There's 52.1 no. million in oh, relation yeah. to the bedroom tax. 37.9 million uh, for the, the Scottish Welfare Fund and 12.1 million in mitigation of welfare reforms. Take them one by one. The 52 million um, is a, a transfer to meet in manifesto commitments to fully mitigate bedroom tax. That's quite clear. And the 37.9 million is Scottish Welfare Fund which was established in April 2013 um, to, after UK government decisions to abolish two elements of the social fund, community care grants and crisis loans. And the powers and funding were devolved to the other administrations within the UK. And it was at each administration's discretion whether to continue to have a fund and how it would be administered. And so that is a transfer to local government to fund that delivery. And last but not least, the £12.1 million is money to provide funding to local authorities for non-bedroom tax discretionary housing payments. Um, and DHPs are administered by the local authorities and are obviously a key element of the wider mitigation of UK welfare reform. So are, are these one-off transfers in relation to this year or will this budget line continue in future years? Um, I, I, my understanding is that this is not the only year, having not been here last year, um, I, this, is, this is a regular transfer. And again, it's the same challenge where uh, responsibility 
and uh, impact would lie with social security and older people budget line and ministerial responsibility but delivery is a uh, local government so you'll be aware of the of the upcoming budget as is in all budgets in recent years local government funding is something that's been a big focus on so how will you ensure transparency just in terms of these allocations so that you know one of the kind of key issues is going to be baselining back to last year's local government settlement um, and we don't want any misunderstanding before we get into the political discussion we don't want any misunderstanding about the figures how we ensure transparency about the figures in relation to these allocations it's a, it's a valid point and hopefully this discussion itself is improving that transparency of again where um, budget lines will be shown in the on the 12th of December um, and on into um, through the, the budget stages um, and then this budget revision because a uh, ministerial responsibility for these uh, these um, budgets lies with the cabinet secretary for social security and uh, older people then these lines will be included in her um, budget. Um, allocation but uh, obviously in terms of deployment because it's local government those revisions will happen throughout the year and I think Scott wants to come in. I just wanted to there, there were a couple of extra tables added in the in the budget document last year that looked to try and reconcile the or add a bit of clarity on the overall local government position and um, forthcoming transfers form part of that and we'll certainly be looking at trying to you know maintain that improved clarity on the on the totality of the local government settlement in the budget document. Thank you. I think, I think that's important, convener, you know, because uh, it's important we all, we've all got a consistent understanding of the figures before we get into any further uh, discussion. There's going to be further discussion on local government. My goodness. Willie. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning, Minister. I wonder if I could just ask you for some clarification on the technical transfer issue that you mentioned of the 312 million pounds which is to, as I understand it is to cover interest and repayments of loans can you just confirm that the overall effect of that is cost neutral in the budget because at first sight you would think oh no we're losing 31 million pounds but that money was all surely was all, would always have to have been set aside at some point and, and is it simply an accounting practice a manoeuvre here to, to put it in the correct place in the accounts? Well, I, I can assure you that the, those technical adjustments are a budget neutral. Um, this is the first year, it was 2017-2018 was the first year that the Scottish Government actually undertook cash borrowing from the National Loans Fund. Uh, previously it was a, a notional um, borrowing arrangement agreed with uh, her um, Treasury and the Scotland Act explicitly states that amounts required for repayment um, of principal and interest should be charged on the consolidated fund, the Scottish consolidated fund, so it needs to be removed from the Scottish budgets and administered centrally uh, and it's reported through the Scottish consolidated funds account. But those details will be shown in the budget supporting a uh, document and I recognise this is a uh, first um, so we'll ensure Sure that any documentation that's published um, with the budget transparently reports that. We'll see that in future in the consolidated fund account and it'll be quite clearly yeah. indicated for us to see that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Neil. Thanks, Kavira. Good morning, Minister. Um, in terms of internal transfers, there's also movement uh, to the higher education support student, uh, student support budget, totalling £28.3 million. Uh, can you tell us how this money will be spent and also... <coughs> I know there's £16.8 million to fund additional places for widening and access. Can you uh, tell us how many places that, that fund might provide? Yeah, so that widening access fund started in 13-14 as part of a four-year phased approach to increase student numbers. And it's now reached a steady state and the transfer is agreed based on the total places each year. And the transfer covers fees and bursaries and uh, for 8,200 um, places in total. Thanks, uh, thanks Minister. Could you... Um could you, could you provide a, a breakdown for us in terms of what institutions benefit from that, that transfer? Yep, I don't have um, the, the breakdown to hand, but I know that £16.8 million from the SFC budget um, funds additional student places for widening access, um, and I can provide the, the member with um, more of a breakdown That'd if he um, is interested. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think anybody else has got any other questions, so we now move to 
Sur les adultes de Ezra Non 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 Ok. Thanks, James. Uh, we now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of the motion on the order. Uh, I invite the Minister to move motion S5M14433 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Budget Scotland Act 2018 Amendment Regulations 2018 draft be approved. To do mum. Um, Minister. I, I move that the Finance Committee recommends that the Budget Scotland Act 2018 Amendment Regulations 18 be approved. Any other questions from members? No other comments? Okay. And I put the question. The question is that motion S5M14433 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, the committee will publish a short report to Parliament setting out our decision on the order. And I thank everyone now and close this meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee.